So th this week we're discussing an interaction approach to popular culture. Um, as I've been working on my new textbook for this, I'm, I'm diving deep into influencer and creator culture and thinking about that. We will talk a bit about that um, on this unit and my brain very well might diverge into that. Uh, but what we're talking about is an interaction approach to popular culture. And David Grazian starts chapter four with this discussion of names. And he talks about it as the rise of Emma. And the point here is Emma went basically from non-existent to the number two name and popularity in 2015. Um, and you can do this with a lot of different stuff. So when I was a kid, there were probably five Jessicas in my elementary school grade, right? And so you can look at the epic rise of Jessica where it peaked in 1987, and by 2018, basically nobody's naming their kids Jessica at this point, right? That is a dramatic change, and we can look through these different names, and I will do that in a second. Um, but his point is that decisions are not made in a vacuum. We interact with each other, and as a product of that interaction, we end up going with one name or over another. Um, so for a long time, Emily was very popular. But Emma became a spin-off, and you, it, it had this rapid rise. Uh, but one thing that I often think about is what about the role of popular TV characters and celebrities in the rise of these names? So yes, by 2015, um, Emma is the second most popular girl name. But I can think of a couple very popular actresses with the name of Emma predating this. Emma Watson, right? So if you watch the Harry Potter flicks and are in, were a kid in love with Harry Potter, then when you come of age, around 2015, you go, oh, I had a kid, I'm gonna name it Emma. That's where you see a lot of this come through. And I, I think it's fascinating as you look through some of these names. Um, I am struck by the number one boy's name being Jackson. Does anybody know a popular TV character by the name of Jackson? What was that? Well, Michael Jackson's a last name, and he was dead at this point. Maybe, per again, last name. Do I have any Grey's Anatomy fans in here? Jackson Avery. Jackson Avery. But something like that can really change where you see these names pop up. So, um, you know, you got your typical um, Emily here. You get the rise of Zoe. There's a couple popular names of Zoe. Zoe Deschanel, Zoe Kravitz, right? Um, <laughs> Logan. Logan Paul? Well, that's a little later on. Wolverine. Wolverine. His name's Logan, right? These names come from somewhere. And I'll tell you, my son's name, this kind of blew my mind. My son's name's Owen. Some people actually look at the popular baby names of a given year and they try to pick it. We weren't doing that at all. My wife wanted like the name Odin 
of the Norse god, and I thought that was a terrible idea. I was like, he's going to get picked on enough from his last name. Why would we put him through having Odin or Diddy? Like, don't, let's not do that to him. Let's, let's try to keep it a little close. So I came up with Owen, and she was like, oh, I love Owen, and we went with Owen. I kid you not. I haven't seen as many lately. His pre-K class, there were three Owens. Not one Odin. Three. No. Not one Odin. Not one. But he, when he was like three years old, if you called him Owen, he would say, my name's not Owen. It's Owen A. I was so excited he was going to say, oh, dear. No, no. Reclaim it. Now he'd probably get mad at you, you know, if you called him Odin. Because um, he hears a story about him how he's almost Odin. Which, as someone that loves Marvel, also not a terrible thing to him. Um, so names come from somewhere. And the fact is that names come from interacting with each other. So that brings us to this interaction approach. And Drazian says on page 75, quote, the interaction approach emphasizes how popular culture spreads throughout a society as an outcome of interpersonal encounters experienced among groups of individuals within particular settings and interactive contexts. So your popular cultural tastes are influenced by people around you. What we're discussing with an in, inter, uh, interaction approach is the micro level interactions. And a lot of times what we're talking about is word of mouth. So here, word of mouth, right? She's telling her something. She looks a little shocked by it. Um, but that's word my image of word of mouth and over here we have a group of people watching it looks like they're watching tv or a movie or something and they're interacting with each other while they do it again popular culture does not exist in a vacuum so what we like in popular culture what we find um, is influenced by the people around us. So, what we're really talking about is social interaction. And the social interaction that gets to social interactionism, which is a term from um, Irving Goffman, He's a very famous sociologist. Uh, we'll be talking more about him in a, in a little while. Uh, we can think about our peer group societies. These are communities of people who regularly interact with each other. These could be anything from work colleagues, friends, family, neighbors. They're people we end up talking to, and they influence um, everything we do. They have a determinant effect on your culture. And you got to remember our definition of culture. Culture is the sounded the beautiful. <laughs> we are in like week 10 of the semester, and y'all got it nailed. You're going to be ready for that one on a test question. Um, it also raises the question of the social self, which he says, quote, our individuals build their self-image from the judgments of others, or at least from what they imagine such evaluations to be. So what we're really talking about here is identity construction that grows from the interactions with other people. And what we often do is we depend on other people to interpret the things around us. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
This emerges in relationship to social psychology. Now there's two types of social psychology. There's social psychology by sociologists and social psychology by psychologists to ever more complicate things for you. Um, we're really talking about the sociologists here. And what social psychology does is it, quote, it's our evaluative judgments may also be influenced by the people around us. What often happens in social psychology is they'll do experimental analysis. And Grazian gives you some examples of these experimental analyses. Uh, he talks about the, the music market. And I mean, I think that this was a great experiment. They told people, they gave them some songs, and they asked them which ones they liked the most without ranking beforehand. And they got one set of responses when they did it without rankings. When they gave people an artificial Billboard Hot 100, The people after hearing the songs tended to rank the songs the same way they were ranked in the artificial rankings. Because what we tend to do is we tend to take in information, say, oh, other people think this way, and I want to be like those other people. We do this all the time with all the different rating systems that exist out there, and we'll talk more extensively about that later in this chapter and in another chapter in a couple weeks. The big idea here, as I mentioned, comes from Irving Goffman, a sociologist that really started um, the field known as social interactionism. Um, Irving Goffman was interested not just in um, the way people interact, but how we change who we are in those interactions. Uh, some of the famous terms that he uses are um, keeping face. Have, have y'all ever used that? Keeping face. So, you know, saving face is another one. Keeping face, saving face, giving face. Um, there, there's one more. But it's all about face-to-face -face interactions and the way we want everybody to come out of that interaction the same as they came into it. So if somebody says something really wrong in a small group, somebody that has more face might give face to help that other person save face. So that's where these phrases come from. It's about give and take in the social interaction. And the main thing he talks about is how our social roles are dramatic performances. Grazian says that, quote, we strategically embody when participating in different social worlds as illustrated by how our interpersonal demeanor shifts as we move among varied settings. And the basic idea here is I want you to think about yourself in one friend group. And y'all are in college, so oftentimes you have different friend groups now, right? Think about the people you hung out with a lot when you were in high school. You're really good friends. Think about how they interact with you now that you're not around. And many of you are first semester freshmen, so it might not be that different yet. But over time, you change as a person. You interact with different groups of people. They treat you a particular way. That's who your social self becomes. But when you interact with another group of people, your social self goes right back to what it was before. 
And that's one thing you'll notice with the difference between college friends and high school friends is good or bad, they'll treat you differently. And there's no way out of that because your personal identity is not something that you have direct control over. Your personal identity is socially constructed by those you interact with. And that's what's really going on here in presentations of self. And notice the different masks. And at the end of the day, uh, one of the things that Irving Goffman calls it is a dramaturgical approach. Everything we're doing is performing. We perform ourselves. We perform our identity for different people. You perform your identity for your parents or guardians different from how you perform for your friends. You are an entirely different human being. You're performing. And theories about gender, for instance, we can actually say that all gender is a performance. Yeah. And what ends up happening is we become instilled in our social identity that other people demand of us more so than what we demand of ourselves. And in actuality, we become the identity that other people ascribe to us in those social interactions. Um, another great thing, when I, when I have my online course, I have them watch an episode of Black Mirror, season three, episode one, Nosedive. How many of you have seen Black Mirror? I need to see the latest season. My wife got tired of it, and I like to watch TV with her. And I'm like, well, can we watch Black Mirror? And I always get rejected. It's from last year? Uh, I noticed it over the summer. Yeah, it's... We but so every those of you not familiar with Black Mirror, there's a newer season. Um, every episode is its own thing. Some of them are like an hour and a half movie length, but they really feel like TV shows, not movies. But you're kind of dropped into this dystopian world. Well, in Nosedive, the social interaction that happens is everybody in that episode uses social media to rate the other people around them and you can only get an apartment rent a car based on your number of stars that you have your rating um so everything goes into creating better social interactions i had to fix my camera not hitting all the way. There we go. Um, so it's a, a great popular culture reference to the theories of Irving Goffman because everything we do then becomes artifice in this episode of Black Mirror. We do things specifically, or they do things, it's not a we. Uh, specifically so that other people have a different image of them so that they get higher social ratings. Because your job depends on it. Your apartment, getting on a flight. I mean, you got to watch the episode. Things really fall apart. I will say, not only that, but if you reach down to a certain lowness, the government starts, like, in that episode, like, Warning you and like threatening you. Yeah. That kind of thing too. Yeah, she ends up in jail. She really takes a nosedive. She was doing everything she could to um, get a top rating. Just pure artifice. And then um, she has a couple bad interactions and she just spirals. And the spiraling just repeat creates more spiraling um, until she finally meets a truck a truck driver who just doesn't care and they, they like come together and not care um, 
So the main argument of this chapter is that, quote, our knowledge and experience of popular culture is often conditioned by the social context in which we interact with other people. First, that happens through the cultural taste influenced by peers. And second, this happens through culture industry executives that depend on micro-level interaction to spread their material. These processes are interrelated. So the culture industry depends on social interaction. As I told you, that fake um, experiment, the fake rankings of music, had an over-determining effect on how people felt about any given song. Um, so Grazian asks here for this chapter, how does content go viral? And what becomes a fad? Um, my favorite, and here, here's a great example for you as I get too far ahead of myself in the chapter. Lil Nas X. It seemed like he came out of nowhere to entirely blow up, right? And Lil Nas, Lil Nas X's song went from zero to billions of views pretty much overnight. So in a way, it feels like, oh, wow, I could drop a song and it would blow up like that. That's not at all the case. He had already been actively involved in online meme culture and had a following already so that when he dropped that song, it wasn't just like, oh, here's my first song and it blows up. He had a network that he was interacting with. You already need that for things to take off. Um, so as I work on the influencer creator chapter, uh, Rolling Stone each year has their creators issue. And this year, one of the journalists decided she wanted to make a new Instagram to see how long it took for her to blow up without using her friends. Well, it took her forever, or no, it was on TikTok. It took her forever to even get anybody to follow her. And like weeks went by and nothing was happening. Because the fact of the matter is, you need to actually be tapped into networks, grow those networks to make them larger. Um, Back when I was on Twitter, my wife was on t Twitter. She was considered a um, children's literature influencer. Uh, she had a blog called Raise Them Righteous talking about like lefty uh, children's books. So she had a pretty good following. She figured out how to use Twitter. And then she told me, and I got a pretty big following at that point. Um, then I got rid of all of it. Um, but the point was, there's actual strategies that you need to take to be able to grow these things. And a lot of those happen because you know people, you have followers, you have friends, right, who will reshare, like your content, make it get bigger, and then other people will find you and that increases your network. So some of what we'll be talking about here are kind of network effects. So what are social networks and how do they spread uh, fashions and trends or fads? Um, so a social network is, quote, individuals connected to one another through a variety of relationships whether based on kinship authority friendship romance or work there are different social networks so the simplest show social network would be a dyad a dyad is a social network of two um, but in any network the power relations can vary 
And it gets far more complicated when you have a network of three. So here in the triad, the network of three, you can see the complexity of the dynamic. Now this is a staged um, interaction, which kind of makes it even worse in its awkwardness. But notice, you can see there's different power dynamics going on between the three. I kind of feel like the guy in the center, he's probably the boss. And the other two seem to be trying to nervously make him feel more comfortable so that he feels better about that. And when you start having interactions like that, that's where you begin to see power, right? He's got his hands like this. He kind of looks in charge. Usually when you touch your face or your neck, does anybody know what that means? Like, trying to like... If you start to see somebody go like this, especially, and he's not quite there, he's right here, but if, you're, if you see somebody going like this, you know how they're feeling? Nervous. Nervous and stressed. They're experiencing a level of anxiety when they start going like this. Somebody's holding their hands like this, they're kind of in charge, right? And you can see she's awkwardly laughing, which is what subordinate, I mean, they look like there's some kind of work relationship going here. That's what a subordinate's going to do, right? And I'm not a social psychologist. I could be reading that entirely wrong. Um, so one thing you can say, and, and this gets back to what I was saying about total Nas X, is what it means to be well-connected. And you can have huge networks of weak ties. Uh, and the example he uses is somebody that has 2,500 Facebook friends. Well, who on earth knows 2,500 people? I mean, there's 120 people in this class. I have another class of 35. That's 155 people right there. Do I feel like I have a network of 155 people from that? No. And they're students. That's a pretty close connection, right? But if you have 2,500 Facebook friends, they're not friends. They're people you're mildly, weakly connected to. Um, and so one thing, though, is that weak ties Grazian says, can be very important for job hunting because strong ties also mean that people are too close and too similar. Whereas weak ties, he says, serve as bridges spanning otherwise separate social worlds. So in other words, if on LinkedIn, y'all got on LinkedIn, I don't know how many of you are on it, but if you got on it, and you only followed other people from this class or connected with other people from this class on LinkedIn, how many job opportunities would you find on LinkedIn? None, because you're all students. None of you have jobs to give on that, right? You don't have that kind of, um, Relationship. One thing when I left Twitter is I started to use LinkedIn to replace Twitter, which probably annoys some people. But I have a good old time posting and reposting and whatever. Um, so sometimes you need the weak ties to be able to expand your network and find other things. Or if like if I were looking for a job and only people that I was friends with on LinkedIn were people at the University of Texas at Arlington, I wouldn't find another professor job through that, right? Or I certainly wouldn't find it in another industry. Uh, you want weaker ties for that kind of thing. So what about pop culture? 
And he says, one interesting thing in popular culture is that birds of a feather flock together. Um, friendship informs taste. We become interested in the same kind of popular culture as our friends. Now there's a give and take there. You find friends based on people who like similar things to you. But then you begin to inhabit their tastes because that's who you hang out with, right? I never thought before I started dating my wife that I'd be on season 22 of Grey's Anatomy or that I'd be sitting around waiting because I didn't watch probably the first five seasons at all until she said, it's a good show, let's binge it. And I was like, all right. And then I got into it, never looked back, and I am with that show till it dies. <laughs> and as I already mentioned, she doesn't want to watch the latest season of Black Mirror, so I haven't been watching it, because what fun is, is it for me to sit and watch Black Mirror by myself and then not talk to anybody directly about it? And probably if I watch it and come in here, half y'all will be mad because I'm spoilers, right? Um, and that's another, that's a very interesting thing with social interaction and binge watching. I don't like to binge. I like to, especially when I hate the fact that at seasons are like six to ten episodes of shows online and I have to wait in a year and a half or two years for the next season because if I watched a show over the course of a weekend and then I gotta wait two years and I actually have to go back and watch some of the previous episodes to know what's going on. But one of the things that happens in our social interaction of popular culture is if you have a friend group or your colleagues, you're all watching the same show and all, the only way to go in and interact with people and talk about those shows is to have watched it and avoid the spoilers, right? So if a show drops today, you better have it watched by tomorrow because when you go into work, people might be talking about episode five and you're only on episode two and there you go, there go all your spoilers, right? Um, so... Yeah, again, we start to watch and like the same things as our friends. Uh, to develop new tastes, you have to reach outside of your peer groups. Reach outside of your friends, outside of your colleagues, outside of your family. To recognize that there's a, this other stuff out there. And algorithms on streaming services are really bad about this. One fun thing to do is to, when you can't find anything else to watch, pull up somebody else's Netflix. And you'll go, oh my God, there's a whole world of shows out there that I would like to watch that I didn't even know existed because the algorithm, the algorithm doesn't tell me it's there. Because Netflix starts telling you, ooh, this is who you are, this is what you like to watch, and then over time you go that's all that's available but that's the same thing as our friend groups right in order to know what else is out there you have to get out there you have to reach out and find different things um so you can really think about popular culture in the way uh trends grow and spread and evolve uh one of the the important key points he talks about here are cultural emissaries. And one of the cultural emissaries he talks about are connectors. He says that connectors are people who bridge a number of groups and can introduce each group to things in other groups. And I think that the best example of this is Ferris Bueller. I'm just curious, how many of you have seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? A good number of you it's a classic. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And not in a, like, when I was recommending you watch Pootie Tang because of its ridiculousness. This is 
just one of those iconic movies from the 80s. I mean, I was, I didn't watch this for years till I was in like high school, which was years after this came out. Um, but basically the main character here, Ferris Bueller, he plays sick and stays home from school. And then he convinces uh, this girl who he had a thing for. These are both his like close friends. This guy, some of you might know as um, Connor on uh, Succession. Anybody watch Succession in here? Another great film. He plays Connor, um, one of the sons. What are the what? Is he one of the Culkin brothers? Not Culkin. What what are their la what's the last name in? Because it's like uh Macaulay Culkin, Kieran. No, no. not no, he's not a Culkin brother. Oh. Kieran Culkin is in that show. He's the other brother. But Connor is the guy that ends up running for president. He's the screw up that nobody um pays any attention to. Um, but Ferris, his thing here is he's like a cultural emissary. He's comfortable in any number of peer groups throughout the movie. So they go to the movie, they're to the muse art museum, and they're here looking at art. They go to a parade. They do all, and he ends up on a float singing, um, which is bad because he's also cutting school, and people see the see that he's in it, and you know. His mom's not happy. Anyway, it's a great show. But he plays that that double point of um, being a cultural emissary. Now, one of the ways culture spreads is by word of mouth. And we could talk about cultural diffusion. Word of mouth is the idea, uh, is, is a concept emphasized by market researchers. People tell other people about great things or cultural artifacts, and then they want to go see it. And one of the things that um, Grazian emphasizes is word of mouth spawns sleeper hit films that become cult classics. So these films didn't do well at the box office, but developed dedicated followings later. Um, the, some examples here are Napoleon Dynamite, which I heard people were excited about in that moment. Um, Big Lebowski, which just celebrated, it had like a 25th anniversary edition of Big Lebowski, nobody really paid attention to it, but then it did really well on the secondary market, which is some, a concept we'll talk about later. Um, Donnie Darko, Fight Club, Office Space, Blade Runner, all these movies did horrible in the theater. But through word of mouth, they became cult classics. My, you know, Donnie Darko, I don't know how many of you have seen that. I can't for the life of me understand that film. I had a roommate, my best friend in college. He would spend like all day watching that movie. I'd go to class, I'd come back, he'd be watching Donnie Darko. Um, so I don't know that I, a lot of these films, you know, they come on like Comedy Central or something and you don't sit down and watch it all the way through. I don't, I don't really see parts of it. But I gotta be honest. I, uh, Napoleon Dynamite was entirely ruined for me. Um, so when it came out, I was playing a lot of music. And most nights I was off playing gigs and I wasn't actually hanging out with my friends all that much. So I wouldn't see them till later on and they had already watched Napoleon Dynamite and they're quoting Napoleon Dynamite 
over and over, and they're all laughing hysterically about it. And I'm like, all right. So then one night, I'm finally home, and they're like, yo, Dave, we got to go watch Napoleon Dynamite. You're going to love it. And for weeks, right, over a month, I've been hearing these quotes of Napoleon Dynamite. I sit down to watch that film, and I was just like, what the hell's going on here? Why are you, what's funny? And they're like, dude, you just got to keep watching it. It's hilarious. And I'm watching it, and I'm going, I think you ruined it for me, right? And I know some of y'all think Napoleon Dynamite's hilarious, so go for it. I, I, I don't think that it's a problem with the film. I think it's a problem with my social network absolutely ruined that film for me. I was expecting like a laugh out loud, my side hurts from laughing kind of film. And that's not at all what, like I'm, I'm expecting like Jim Carrey or something. <laughs> and that's not what it is. It's more like you're laughing at him than laughing with him. Um, so anyway, maybe I need to give it another try since nearly two decades has separated. Because that must have been 2005 that that really came out because it was when I was a senior in college. Because I know where I was when I watched it. Um, anyway. This used to be generated by face to face but now rating systems help to spread word whether you're talking about Yelp Netflix Amazon TripAdvisor all, everything that we have has rating systems attached to it so we can immediately go oh yeah I don't want to watch that film it, it didn't get good reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and I already told you that my wife told me, oh, Wild Robot got not, this was, I think Wild Robot was a, a Napoleon Dynamite situation. She goes, it got a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Do you want to go with us? And I was like, yeah, 98%. I'm good to go with that. Let's go. And then I sat there and was like, where's the plot? There's no plot. It took like an hour for the plot to hit. I was like, man, Rotten Tomatoes lied to me. Y'all, America lied to me. But that's how we do things. And a lot of times, some rating systems, if it gets a bad review, I go, oh, that's the good stuff. That's what you do with Rotten Tomatoes, because if the critics score it low, that's how you know it's a good movie. That's what I do. No, like, I tend to like critics more than I like the American public. That's me. We we gotta play games with these systems at this point. Um, and so he also addresses the concept of buzz. Buzz is when something gets a considerable amount of word of mouth. And here's an important point about buzz. A lot of buzz can attract an audience regardless of the content of the buzz. What that means is if there's a lot of buzz about a film, it could be negative things about the film. But if people absolutely hate a film, that will actually attract people to it. Because human beings want to know what other human beings are talking about. So people will actually watch a movie or a television show to see the train wreck. We all like a good train wreck, right? I'm trying to think of like a famous meltdown that maybe you didn't watch live, but you were like, oh man, I got to see that happen. Here's a good one. Joaquin Phoenix. Um, oh. Joaquin Phoenix went on 
The Late Show with David Letterman. And he just pretended like he was stoned to hell. And he just kind of sat there and was like, Yeah. It had like a shaky voice and everything. And David Letterman is like, what is your problem? Why aren't you talking to me? And then later on, Joaquin Phoenix was like, yeah, that was all me acting. I'm perfectly fine. He did it to create buzz. And because he was, I think he was, Joaquin Phoenix had like an alter ego he developed as like a rapper or something for a small period of time. And that's what he was promoting. So he was doing this long game to create buzz. I didn't watch it live, but I looked it up on the internet. I was like, wait a second, I got to see what happened there, you know, because it was like in the newspaper and stuff. And I was like, I've got to see what this is. And it was just as ridiculous as everybody was saying it was. So there's an old saying. Oh, wait, well, now I forgot the actual saying because I'm terrible at saying. All, I think it's all press is good press. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I didn't screw it up. The basic be idea being, you, if you do awful things and you get news coverage for it, that's not necessarily a bad thing depending on what you're going for. And that, that was what Joaquin Phoenix was going for, right? Like, if people react, that'll get its own publicity in the, for the thing that I'm trying to promote. And this is something that I think influencers really tap into. Some people try to aim to be incredibly viral and toxic, or they, they I shouldn't say viral and toxic, they, they aim to be incredibly toxic as a character because people love to hate them. And that gets them more views. More views equals more likes, more advertising, right? So it's a, it's, it's a phenomenon that actually goes on. Um, Grazian gives us three types of people who spread word of mouth. The first type are opinion leaders. Opinion leaders, he says, are people with, quote, deep familiarity and involvement with specific kinds of cultural products, categories, or genres to make informed recommendations to their peers. So these are people within a peer group who are known to be experts on a particular thing, whether that's um, and it's usually related to their occupation or hobby. So I got one friend that I got my PhD with, and he is like the king of useless facts about um, popular music in particular. And I actually study popular music, and he doesn't. He knows far more than I do. Because I look at like the industry side of stuff, and he could be like, oh, so-and-so was in this band and that label, and then they moved to this label, and I'm like, I, that's way beyond any kind of knowledge of anything that I have. But if I want to know information about something, he's who I go to. Because he can give me that kind of information in a real quick way. I got another old colleague. It's weird, being an expert on popular music, or the music industry, people always ask me about whatever genre they're into, and they act like I should know everything about that genre, but as you've probably perceived, I have very specific music tastes that are diverse, but very particular. Um, so when people start talking to me about things, they're like, oh, you're the music guy. You must know about X, Y, and Z. And I kind of go like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And I have no idea. Um, so, and it's all what we're, you know, speaking of that, 
how we're influenced by the music and the culture we grow up around. So my parents were hippies. And when they were in that sweet spot of an age, was kind of ended up being the 70s. So they listened to, like, soul, R&B, and rock. There wasn't a lot of, like, punk or anything like that in my parents' repertoire. Where I have other friends, and they grew up listening to that. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. Um, so that's where we get it from. But so these people uh, become opinion leaders. Then we get to uh, the early adopters. They're always the first to buy something in their network. Uh, and they have two types of influence for the early adopters. There's people with passive influence, and the fact is that their conspicuous consumption influences others, and active influence. And those are the people that demonstrate the items to their friends, right? Here I like to think about people that buy all the latest tech gadgets, right? They're waiting in line at the Apple store for the new thing to drop. And then they not only have to have it, the, or the, the, the passive influencers, they're there and they have it and the friends see that they have it, right? The active influencers are the ones that show up, they get it, and then they gotta show everybody what they got. People do this with popular culture as well, right? It's not just tech gadgets. You get, you start listening to a new album, a new artist, you're like, oh, you gotta check her out, she's great. And they tell you about it. It's not like a private thing that they go home and they jam, right? It's the telling other people about this thing. And finally here, you get the market mavens. And market mavens acquire a wealth of knowledge about products. These people have, quote, obsessive quest for knowledge about brands, consumer culture, and the marketplace, but their overwhelming desire to share their widely held expertise with friends and with complete strangers. So opinion leaders differ from market mavens because opinion leaders have a given reason for wanting to know about these things. Um, the market mavens are like, yo, I'm gonna get the new cat, the latest catalog from um, PC World or the PC World magazine, and I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna learn about every product, and I'm gonna go tell everything about or everybody about every little thing that I learn about here. <clears throat> That's it for today. I'll see y'all Thursday.